Hello and welcome to this, the second in a series of webinars looking at JBoss EAP6. Uh, the first one of these was done last week, that's available now on our YouTube channel. I'll give you details of that at the end. A uh, quick introduction to myself, my name is Andy Overton and I work as a Senior Managed Services Consultant for C2B2. Today I'm going to be looking at some of the core differences between JBoss EAP5 and EAP6. Now I'm not going to cover everything today, but I'm going to give you an overview of some of the main differences and the most important ones. So we're going to be looking at um, the directory structure of EAP6 and the server configuration. We'll be taking a look at the boot process, uh, investigating the subsystems and profiles, looking at the major change uh, with regards to the standalone and domain, the new domain mode, looking at clustering and then taking a brief look at the end at the management interfaces. Okay, so first up, the directory structure. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here because it's not particularly exciting. <laughs> um, but basically we have the bin and the docs directories are the only two that are the same in AP5 and AP6. Now the key changes are with regards to the domain mode and the standalone directory. And this is a big change in AP6 and we'll go back into some detail on that later. And also the a new modules folder, um, and I'll also discuss that. Um, one thing we can see here is I've expanded the server directory and the standalone directory. Now this is basically showing the new way of doing configuration in AP6. In 5, you had a bunch of directories here. And these basically gave you the config for your particular server. And in the EAP6, this has changed. It's now done by individual XML files. And we've got a set of XML files here in the standalone, under standalone configuration. And these are what you'd use to describe the configuration of your server. So, as I just mentioned, the server configuration is now done by uh, XML files. This is, these are found under standalone configuration. There's now no external config files. All the config goes into here for a particular server. So, these files basically define the server, the modules that make up the server, um, things like authentication, interfaces, ports used, login config, new data sources, JMS, everything like that. Um, it's all now found in these individual files. Um, you can modify these or create your own. Uh, it's probably best to take one of these and modify to your own needs. So there's four particular ones. There's standalone.xml and that gives you support. Um, JBoss EAP6 is the first uh, JE6 certified JBoss, and this gives you the support of the e web profile plus some extensions. The standalone full gives you the Java e full profile um, and all server capabilities but without clustering. And then we've got two down the bottom for clustering standalone HA.xml, that's the default profile with clustering capabilities, and then the full HA gives you the full profile with clustering. Um, the boot process has changed in EAP6. Um, services are now started concurrently. So this takes advantage of uh, multi-core processes. And a big change is that non-critical services are now lazily loaded. So basically, previously in uh, EAP5, you had to slim down or remove services if you didn't want them. Um, they've taken a different approach now and basically on startup only the core services and the most important ones are started up on startup and non-critical ones are only loaded um, when they, an application actually needs them. So um, this, this leads to reduced boot time and reduced memory consumption and it is incredibly quick to boot up now. 
and uses a much smaller memory imprint. But in a live environment, you may see slowdown when an app starts for the first time, as so it'll have to load all the necessary services as they're not loaded on startup. Now there's um, two things here, subsystems and profiles, uh, a new part of EAP6. Uh, five used a Pojo based microcontainer, six used a service based one. And the idea of sus subsystems, they're basically a particular set of capabilities that extend the application server core. These are um, extensible, you can create your own subsystems and it comes with a bunch of these so you've got kind of things like the web server transaction manager uh, hornet queue j groups infinispan they're all subsystems um, which are loaded on startup or a particular set of those will be loaded on startup um, which is where profile comes in this is basically a named set of subsystem configurations so if you have a standalone server, that runs a single profile, and that gives you a set of subsystems that you want to be part of your server. And in a managed domain, um, you can have many profiles available, but with different servers than in different profiles. Okay, so moving on now to um, standalone and domain mode. Now this is a big change in AP6. Um, standalone mode is basically the same as a JBoss AP5 server in that each server has its own set of config files and on startup it reads those config files and then all management and configuration is local to that box. Whereas the new domain mode this is very similar to the way WebLogic works where you have um, in WebLogic you have a node manager and then you have a domain and a set of servers and the node manager looks after those servers. This is very similar to that. Um, you have a server as part of a domain. You've got one central um, config repository file um, on one machine for the whole domain. And then you have a, what's called a domain controller, which loads that up. Um, all this is done centrally, so like WebLogic and WebSphere, it's all centrally managed and you have no need to start up individual servers whereas if you do standalone mode you have to start them all individually okay so a quick kind of overview of what this looks like in a system um, a domain can consist of multiple uh, physical or virtual hosts so here we've got four hosts um, every, so this is a domain, every domain needs a, one domain controller and this does the centralized management. And then every host needs a separate host controller. Um, and that controls the server instances on that particular node. So here we've got host two with server one and two, host three, a couple of servers on there, and then host four with one individual server. Uh, so the domain controller interacts with the host controllers um, in order to manage the server instances. So this allows you to stop and start them, um, things like that. Then we also have this idea of server groups. So here we've got one, two, and three in a server group. And four and five are also in a server group. It's not particularly clear on here, I'm afraid. This was done in PowerPoint, but this is now done on Linux, and it's not quite done in it properly, but I apologize for that. But we have one server group of server one, two, and three, and one server group of four and five. And the idea is that basically all servers of the same server group perform the same tasks. And then so when you deploy an application, you'll generally not deploy it to an individual server, you'll deploy it to a server group. Um, and it's also possible to manage different server groups in one domain, like in production, staging, or in a test server group. So bit more on each of these, so your domain controller is basically a central management server. Now the controller and the server instances of each host are running separate JVM processes and these are monitored by what's called a process controller. So you have single one of these on each host 
and that creates this host and server processes. And the process control itself is a separate JVM process, and that's responsible for spawning the other processes and monitoring their lifecycle. And then if the host if the host controller process crashes, the process controller will start start back up the host controller. Um, and also each server that's configured with a, there's a parameter you can use called auto start, and that'll say whether you want to auto start the server when it uh, when it goes down. Now, domain mode is completely independent from clustering, so you can do clustering standalone or with standalone servers or with servers in domain. Uh, it provides features for managing cluster environments, um, such as rolling deployment to a set of servers or rolling out a config change to a set of servers. Um, it allows you to start, stop, uh, pause servers from a single console. So it makes it easier to handle a cluster environment. And also something to know there's no hot deploy in domain mode. You need to use the command line. Whereas you can still do hot deploy in standalone mode, although obviously that's not recommended in production. Now in order to configure domain mode, there's two main files. Um, server configuration of the domain is done in the domain.xml file of the domain controller and that's located under domain configuration. Um, it's similar to standalone.xml, uh, basically defines your domain uh, with a set of extensions, uh, system properties and then a bunch of server profiles. The host.xml file is used for the host controllers and this contains server-specific information. Um, gives you a list of servers and their names, whether you want them to auto start, their port bindings, and then any other sort of host-specific host specific settings. So I'm just going to take a quick look at those. So this is the domain.xml file. So as you can see here, we have a bunch of extensions. Then we have a lot of subsystems that are going to be used in the domain. Um, login information, so as I said, it's very similar to the standalone.xml. And then and then at the bottom, as I mentioned there, we have a bunch of server groups. So you can create your own server groups. We've also got the um, host.xml file. Now this gives you a bunch of management stuff at the top. We specify the um, interfaces, the JVM params, and then at the bottom here, as I mentioned, you have the servers. So these are the particular servers in your domain. So you have server 1, server 2, server 3, but this is just an example one that comes with it. Okay, so that's domain mode basically. Um, now we're going to take a quick look at clustering. Um, EAP5 used JBoss Cache for clustering. Um, EAP6 uses InfiniSpan as the distributed cache technology on which the clustering services are built. 
Um, in order to transmit data between the clustered nodes, um, InfinisBand uses J-groups as the underlying subsystem. And there's two protocol stacks, UDP and TCP, for communication amongst the different nodes. Uh, TCP can be used where um, you have an environment where it doesn't support multicast. So in last week's uh, webinar, we looked at switching to using TCP. It's very simple. Um, and UDP is the default uh, stack. So the standard um, high availability profile or standalone HA XML contains four pre-configured cache containers um, for the application between the cluster nodes. So we have web for uh, distributing and caching web sessions um, over the cluster. We have FS, uh, sorry, SS, SFSB for the application of stateful session beans. We have Hibernate, uh, that's a sec level cache for JPA and Hibernate. And then we have Cluster, which is used for distribution of just general objects over the cluster. So a quick one now, the management interfaces. So in EAP5, you had the admin console, the JMX console, and then you had this shell script called Twiddle, which you could use as well. It's all a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, EAP6, they've cleaned this up. Uh, we now have a new management console. Uh, it's much better than it was before. And you also have the, we have a command line interface. Uh, it's very similar to uh, WLST in WebLogic, if you've ever used that. The Admin console is available at localhost 9990, 9990 uh, console. And CLI, the command line interface, can be run from the bin directory. It uh, gives you two basic levels of commands. There's the high level commands. These are basically convenient commands. So the convenience commands for running common tasks. These like starting up, shutting down, and deploying. And we also have the access to low level, we're using low level tasks, you provide it with a resource address and operation names and parameters, and you can then invoke any operation on any resource. This gives you a, the ability to script as well, um, similar to WLST, so you can write scripts to do particular things. Uh, it's a very welcome addition. Twiddle was okay, but um, from my experience and having had a play about with CLI, it seems much better. Okay, apologies again, that's changed slightly as it's in under Linux. But basically we have a YouTube channel, and there's, this video will be available on there. And there's others available too, including last week's webinar. Um, I'll also be uploading a blog. I'll go into some more detail about some of the things I've covered today, and that'll be available on our blog, ctb2.co.uk slash blog. So that's it for today. Um, I hope you will join us for the third in this series, where we'll look at the migration path from EAP5 to EAP6. Thank you.